Harvest Church. I'm Jeff Forster. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we are kicking off a brand new message series called 21 Days of Prayer. If, you're, uh, if this is your first time, well, welcome. We're glad that you're here. You picked a great weekend to be with us as we kick off this new series. Um, before we start the message today, I just want to celebrate with you a little bit. You know, we received one more offering at the end uh, last week for the uh, church planning initiative that we we're a part of, t- uh, the Timothy Initiative. And uh, we total have raised 33000 a little over $33,000. So congratulations, guys. You guys did a great job on that. There's a lot of pop and noise there. Um, I'm really excited about it because that means now we're 110, more than 110 churches that will help start in 2019. That's more than 110 orphans and widows that will uh, be cared for as well because that's a big part of what we do when we launch brand new churches. And over 2,750 new believers as a result of the 110 churches that you guys are helping uh, start. So just in 2019, Those numbers are real. And it turns out you, because of your participation, you're part of a movement that together we will help launch over 19,000 new churches around the world. People go, wow, 19,000 churches, that's a lot. So uh, there's people who study this around the world, missiologists. They say there's a little over 5 million total churches in the world. The huge majority of them are in the West, so Europe and in North America. Um, But the, the number, in order to be able to have a church within walking distance of everybody in the world. We need about between five and seven million more. So if we want everybody to know Jesus, well, then it's going to require a whole lot more. But 19,000 this year, that's nothing to, uh, uh, you know, look down on. We're really excited about that, that we get to be a part of it. And then if you're wondering where are our resources going, where are your resources going? We're working with a strategic partner in uh, eastern Cuba over on the Guantanamo, Santiago de Cuba side that uh, has started a church planning network. They're very successful. They're doing an extraordinary job. We're going to partner uh, some more with them as we launch the Timothy Initiative with them. We're also, um, many of you know, we've invested for years with the POCOT in uh, in northwest Kenya, just south of Lake Turkana. Uh, The POCOT people are an animistic tribe. Uh, You know, a decade and a half ago, many of them still weren't wearing much clothes, right? So they're just now coming into modern society. Um, There's about 650, 700,000 of them that have never even heard the name of Jesus, uh, we were in a village uh, a year and a half ago, and when we asked if they knew who Jesus Christ was, the, the village elder came back to me and said, we don't know who Jesus Christ is, but if you tell us what village he's from, we'll help you find him. So they thought Jesus was lost, and they were, we were looking for him, and uh, that'd be the only reason why, because we were the only outside guests they'd ever had come to their village, and so it's a big deal. So there's lots of people who don't know the name of Jesus, and we just want everybody to know Jesus, and so that's where we're going. We're also helping open up a brand new country that has never had a church planting movement ever. Former communist country, almost 100% uh, Muslim background. I'm not going to say the name because people watch our videos, uh, but just pray for us as we begin to open that one up. And then go with us, right? Uh, the, the best things in my life have happened from saying yes, not saying no, right? And so when opportunities come, uh, open up your life and, and say yes. And so we're, we're doing six, as, a, as Heritage Church, we're doing six vision trips this year around the world. We'll be in Cuba twice, once in May and once in November. You should go with us. It's not that expensive. Uh, and Cuba's pretty open. They're, they're not, if you're going for religious purposes, there's not a big issue with that. Uh, we'll be back in Kenya over Memorial Day weekend. That means you only have to miss just a couple days of work. Uh, we'll be in Tanzania and Zanzibar, one of my favorite places in the world in October. Uh, we'll be, I mean, in July, rather. We'll be in Sri Lanka in uh, maybe one of the most beautiful countries in the whole world um, in October. So maybe you go with us. I don't know. But we'd love to have you be a part. We're going to send out an email this week, churchwide, and then we'll have more information over the next couple weeks because you need to start making plans if you want to go with us. But uh, uh, you can make a difference and go see what God is doing and come back and translate that into your own world today. So as I mentioned, we're beginning a brand new series today. And uh, I just want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is? Do you believe that? Uh, many people in the room will say yes. And some in the room will say, I'm not sure. I don't even know. Right? That's okay. If you're investigating faith, uh, this is a safe place for you. You're very welcome here. We love having that dialogue and that conversation with open-minded people. And uh, we, we, uh, we're not threatened by you. Hope you're not threatened by the conversation that we're having uh, today. This is a great place to investigate. But most of the people in the room over this weekend, we'll have a couple thousand people attend Heritage Church. Um, most people will say, yeah, I, I believe Jesus is who he says he is. And, and I want to ask you, do you believe he can do what he says he can do? And again, I think most people, 
mental assent? Yes, I believe that Jesus can do what he says he can do. Well, then, if I told you that you were going to have the opportunity to talk with Jesus for 15 minutes this afternoon, and you could make one request of him, what would your request be? If you could ask him anything, would you ask for protection? Would you ask for a new job? Would you ask for the Lions to finally win a playoff game? Right? Would you, would, would you ask for more money? What, what would you ask for? Right? The disciples got this opportunity. There were these 12 guys. They followed Jesus everywhere for about three and a half years. He was their rabbi. He was their teacher. And these guys, these 12 disciples, uh, had this opportunity. As a matter of fact, it's not in your notes, but in Luke chapter 11 is one of the times that it, it references this issue or this moment. And they came to Jesus one day, and they had a request. They just said, Jesus, teach us to pray which is really extraordinary to me. Of all the things that they could ask Jesus for, they said, Jesus, teach us to pray, right? Think about this. These are guys who'd lived with Jesus for three and a half years. They'd watched Jesus preach the greatest sermons ever. They watched Jesus do miracles. They saw Jesus heal the sick. They saw Jesus raise the dead and all kinds of things, but they didn't ask, Lord, teach us to preach, They didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to draw a crowd. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to do miracles or, Lord, teach us to raise the dead. Instead, they just simply said, teach us how to pray. They saw that this one thing in Jesus' life is what set him apart. They understood that the time that Jesus spent in prayer was the life support system of Jesus Christ. They recognized that it was the key to his life. The Bible says many, many times that it was Jesus' habit to go pray. Many times it would say that he would go out into the wilderness to pray, or he'd go up into the mountains to pray, or he'd go out on the lake to pray. He'd pull away from the crowds. He'd spend time in prayer. It said it was his habit to get up early in the morning and go pray. Often they saw him go pray. So when the disciples had an opportunity to ask Jesus for anything, they didn't ask for all the wow things happening in Jesus' life. They understood that the power in Jesus' life was in his prayer life. And so they asked one thing. They said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so we're beginning this new series called 21 Days of Prayer, right? And and, and there's nothing more vital to your Christian life than prayer. And we're doing this because, you know, this isn't a knock on anybody in the room, but the reality is, if we're honest, most of us know more about Bird Box and Netflix and Princess Meghan and Prince Harry and CNN and Fox News and the Oscars than we do about prayer. And so maybe it's a good time at the very beginning of 2019 to take a couple of weeks and really dig into this. But a lot of us feel uncomfortable praying, quite honestly. And so we want to talk about, demystify a lot of this. We, a lot of us, we have the sense that it's the priests and the monks and the nuns and the religious elite who do that stuff on our behalf. And we just don't understand the power uh, that is available to each of us individually if we pray. Some of us, it's kind of a drudgery, right? It sounds boring or whatever. And usually that's also because we Um, just don't understand it. So we want to uh, help you understand that prayer, personal prayer in your own life is far more than most people have experienced in their life. The power of prayer is far more than most people have experienced in their lives. And if you understand how important it is for you, it's far easier for you to say, God, teach me how to pray. And that's what this message series is all about. So this series is for you. So today, uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. So if you would, grab your notes out of your program. I'll help you fill in a few blanks and try to stay on course and talk about what I commit to talk about today. Because sometimes I can chase rabbits. And that's one of my New Year's resolutions is to not chase rabbits. So here's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 are what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Anytime I introduce the Sermon on the Mount, I remind people this is the longest message that Jesus preaches in the Bible. This is where uh, Jesus taught us almost all the things that you know he said that he's famous for. Turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, right? The golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. This is where he taught us to pray our Father who art in heaven. This is where he taught us judge not that you be not judged. This is where he said that you're a city on a hill, you're salt, you're light in the world. All those things that Jesus taught us Uh, to love our enemies, all these radical teachings all come from Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's a summary of all the rest of the messages that you find uh, throughout the Bible that Jesus preached. So in Matthew chapter 6, as we were getting ready to launch this, I I wanted to launch this weekend with just an understanding of the Lord's Prayer. It's it's a model prayer. And then as I was looking at it, it dawned on me, no, I want to start with this first. Uh, Because what I see in this passage that gives us the Lord's Prayer, our Father 
who art in heaven. It, it also talks about some other things. And so uh, let's, let's look at what Jesus said. He says in Matthew chapter 6, watch out. Do not do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. Would you circle the word to be admired? Just circle those words to be admired. Do not do your deeds publicly to be admired for, by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give, circle the words when you give. When you give to someone in need, do not do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward they'll ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. The reason why I had you circle the words when you give is because it's just an assumption. Jesus isn't saying if you choose to be generous. Jesus is assuming real followers of his will be generous people to others, take care of other people's needs. That's what he's saying. And then he follows right behind that with the famous passage. He says, when you pray, so circle the words when you pray. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. I don't know, maybe you've been in, in, around you know, people in a meditation kind of a thing or in temples or whatever, but where, uh, you know, da 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 right? And they say the same things over and 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 over again to finally, you know, release their mind from everything else and dial in on this one prayer that they're bringing to the universe or whatever. And Jesus says, don't do that. That's not how I want Christians to pray. I don't want followers of God pray like that. As a matter of fact, he says that's what the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. You don't have to go on and on and on and on. Just ask. That's what he says. And then he says, pray like this. And this is where, uh, so here's a modern translation, but this is where our Father who art in heaven, right? He says, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield the temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So there's assumption when you give. There's an assumption when you pray. And then the last one, when you fast. Circle that, when you fast. He says, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth that this is the only reward that they'll ever get. But when you fast... Again, he's assuming you will. Comb your hair, wash your face. Then no one will notice that you're fasting, except your father who knows what you do in private, and your father who sees everything will reward you. So every once in a while, you'll hear somebody really take this passage and, and, and drive it further than Jesus is taking it. They'll say, anytime you do charity work, nobody should ever know that you're doing charity work. Or anytime you pray, nobody should ever see you pray. Or anytime you fast, nobody should know, or you're not going to get rewarded. And that is not what Jesus is saying here. As a matter of fact, when you go back, he says in that first sentence, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, right? Um, uh, He says, don't go out and try to get attention when you're praying. He says, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do because they want people to admire them for their fasting. It's the intent behind it. If you're doing it so other people see you, that is the reward. But if you're doing it to serve others and other people happen to see you that doesn't steal your reward jesus is calling us out on our attitude and our intent not on the fact that somebody might notice it as a matter of fact at one point in this same message matthew 5 6 and 7 that jesus is preaching at one point he says let your light so shine before men that they would see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven one of the greatest testimonies you could have is being generous being people of prayer being people that are committed to in their faith and and living that out Uh, in front of others, not so you can get attention, but so you can point people to Jesus. So Jesus isn't against you being noticed. You don't have to hide your good deeds. He's just saying, don't don't do it so that you get attention for it. So here's what I want to do. He says, when you you give, when you pray, when you fast. When you give, when you pray, when you fast. These are all like Christianity 101, entry-level Christianity. And so with those ideas, I want to give you three really big thoughts. The first one is generosity demonstrates my priorities. When I'm generous, it demonstrates my priorities. Don't worry. I'm not going to say you need to give money to Heritage Church. I know. It, you should be me when I talk about generosity up, up here because I get to look at your faces. It hurts so bad when I talk about your money. It's like, oh, you're just white knuckling it for the next seven. It's like seven minutes is what I have in here. So hang on. You can make it past it. But Jesus says when you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do. So he's assuming that you're going to give. The, there's more in the Bible about generosity Jesus says more about generosity and money 
than he does about faith and hope and love combined. It's pretty extraordinary. There's a reason for that. Why? Because generosity is the most practical expression of all three of those. If you have faith that God's going to provide everything you need, it's way easier for you to be generous to other people because we hang on tight. We're, you know, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge because we're afraid people are going to take our stuff from us. But when we're totally faith-filled, dependent on God, we know God's going to supply our needs because he did yesterday. He'll supply them tomorrow too. We can release a little bit be generous to other people. One of the most, rather than talking about your faith, generosity is maybe one of the best ways to demonstrate your faith. It's the same thing with hope. Right? You have hope for tomorrow because God took care of your needs yesterday. And you can spread hope for others because God can use you to help take care of the uh, others' needs. You can spread hope. Maybe the best expression of hope is not to tell people, have hope, brother, have hope, sister. Instead, maybe help them with hope, right, by being generous. And then the same thing with love. Love is action, right? Uh, uh, generosity is love in action. The Bible says God so loved the world that he what? He gave, right? So this is really big. So here's what Solomon, really smart guy, uh, I love reading the writings of Solomon. He says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Every time I read that passage, I always think of Scrooge in the Christmas Carol, right? He had no friends, no family, nobody that cared about him because he just hung on so tightly. But in the end, when he finally releases and he winds up being generous, suddenly he's got family, he has friends, he has people who care about him, right? And, and, and life comes back into his life. There's far more to life than just money and stuff. Relationships are even more important. So he says, give freely, become more wealthy, be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. <clears throat> Generosity is, I think, the number one cure. It's the top antidote to materialism, right? Materialism, materialism just permeates our society. It's this whole idea of get and get more, get all you can. Your life isn't really all it could be until finally you get what others have, right? And I think social media has just, especially, you know, Instagram, Facebook, all those really even just exacerbated that issue, really pushed that even more because now we see all the time everybody's highlight reels about how great their life is and everything they have. And so we've kind of moved into this materialistic mindset. And giving is the only antidote to materialism because giving is the exact opposite of get, 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 right? The exact opposite of get, get, get is give, give, give. Every time you give, you're taking a counterculture stand. Maybe one of the most counterculture things you can do in life is not to go burn a city down or protest or, or you know, get in front of TV cameras with your sign. Maybe the most counterculture thing you can do is choose to go upstream. When the whole rest of the world is pursuing more and more and more, you turn it around and decide to be more and more generous. And by the way, God says the more generous you are, the more you have. Because now you become a conduit of generosity to others. We refuse to be suckered by the myth that life is all about accumulation. Whenever you give, it's a win over the devil, right? There's a spiritual victory there. It's also a witness to the world because the world's watching and they notice how you live. They notice that you're different. And by the way, I would, I would recommend this. When you choose to be generous, try to have your kids see it. Try to have your kids be a part of the generosity. Include them. Our family is a generous family. The, the, the values of our family is not just keep, but the values of our family is to be generous to others. It's not just about us. Because I'm most like God when I'm generous. I, I, I am most like God when I give. God so loved the world that he give. And, and money and how I view it and the, the way that I see the other people around me. Again, I'm not saying write checks to Heritage Church. I'm saying when I choose to see my money as not just being for me, I'm blessed to be a blessing to others, it demonstrates my priorities. So my job is to challenge you, right? My job is to, to encourage you and challenge you to become everything that God made you to be and to use your life and the resources and the blessings that he's given you to the fullest. That's my job. As a matter of fact, here's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our what? Enjoyment. So are you supposed to be embarrassed about all that you have? Not at all. Should you feel guilty about it? No. Is this whole movement to argue with you about how privileged you are, is it reasonable in God's eyes? No. You've been blessed. Of course you're privileged. But you're blessed to be 
a blessing. You never feel ashamed about the blessing you have in your life. You never feel ashamed about the opportunity that you have in your life. You leverage those things to be a blessing to others. God gave it to you not to feel guilty, not to be ashamed. Instead, he gave it to you so you can make an impact in the world as well. So he says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. And then he says, by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. God tells us that real life begins when it stops being all about us. Of course, enjoy what you have. There's no problem with that. But life isn't all about me, right? God wants to use me to make a difference in the lives of others. And real life begins when, I'm, when I stop hoarding and I start being aware of the fact that it's not just about me. I've been blessed to be a blessing to others. So that's the first one. The second one is prayer demonstrates my dependence. So Jesus says when you give, give in this way, he's assuming you're going to give if you're a real follower of God. If real faith is in you, you're going to be a generous person. And when you do that, it changes you. And then prayer demonstrates my, de- demonstrates my dependence. He says when you pray, and then he prays like this, right? He says pray like this. So we're going to take an entire weekend, probably next weekend, we're going to take an entire weekend and discuss the Lord's Prayer. So I'm going to break that down and, because it's, it's a framework. That's not the prayer Jesus prayed all the time. That's not the prayer that he's requiring us always to pray. He doesn't say, when you pray, pray these words. He says, when you pray, pray like this. He's giving you a model there. And models are extraordinary. Uh, models are, are, are useful for us because they help focus our thinking a little bit. So I want to hi- highlight uh, the model that Jesus gave us next week. But it's just a framework. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know about you. So, you know, I get paid to be a Christian, right? Not to be a Christian, but to be a pastor, right? So you would assume as a part of my job, I'm supposed to pray, all that kind of stuff, and read my Bible and care for people. Yes, okay, that's a lot of what I do. But I'll tell you this, the ADHD thing is very real in Jeff's life. And so I'll decide I'm going to pray, right? And so I'm like, oh, God, you're so good. I'm following the model Jesus gives us. You know, God, you're so good. I want you to be lifted high. And suddenly it dawns on me, wait a minute, did I give lunch money to my daughter this morning? And Oh, talking about my daughter, talking about a, uh, what a great night we had, movie night. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking about all this other stuff. <gasps> what are we going to have for dinner? I forgot about dinner, right? And it just goes on and on. And then I go, oh, I need to pray. And I come back in, and I'm constantly thinking about everything else. That's just what happens. And so there's great benefit in writing out prayers. It helps bring me focus. It, it does. And, and, and maybe that would be useful to you, too. Uh, sometimes you feel weird about that, right? But don't feel weird about it. If you take a, a whole Bible and you open it to the middle, you usually open up to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, 150 chapters. Every one of those Psalms is a prayer that David or somebody else wrote out, and then they put it to music. It was just a written out prayer. And so a lot of times that's useful. For some, you go, I'm not even sure I'm comfortable writing out a prayer. So this 21 days of prayer that we're kicking off, on the way out the door today, we'll give you a 21 days of prayer, uh, a prayer guide. Tomorrow morning, we'll start at 6 a.m. here. We'll, we'll pray together, or you can do it with your family. Uh, you can do it alone. You can do it with some friends at work, whatever. But uh, what we'll do is each day, it's maybe about three paragraphs or so that will kind of highlight the idea behind what we're praying that day. And then we'll give you a model prayer for that day, a few words that will help guide where you're going. So there's these 21 model prayers that pretty much cover the whole gambit of your life. So model prayers help us to focus on a topic. And so we'll each, each day we'll briefly discuss the topic and then we'll offer these models for you. And we'll draw near to God together in that. As a matter of fact, here's what he says in James 4. Come near to God and he'll what? Come near to you, right? God just says, hey, you draw near to me. All you need to do is start heading my direction. That's what God said. Just, just head my direction. It's not like there's magic words or magic form. Just come my way. And, and here's, here's really the significant statement. He said, humble yourselves before the Lord. When I, when I decide to bring my life to God, that is a humble act. I'm just saying, God, I, I need you in my life. So humble yourselves before the Lord, and he'll lift you up. And then during this time, we're going to bring our worries and our, and our needs to God over the next 21 days. Right? G, uh, the, the Bible says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about what? Everything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Right. Tell God what you need, the Bible says, and thank him for all that he's done. I say all the time, back, and I started this back when I was a youth pastor, uh, you know, middle school, high school, age kids and, and young adults. I say all the time, every problem is a prayer problem. We'd be on a mission trip somewhere, some kind of thing, pop up, it's difficult, everybody's kind of at each other's throat, and I'd always remind everybody, uh, every problem is a prayer problem. And then every opportunity is a prayer opportunity. 
right? Every opportunity is an opportunity to go to God in prayer. People might ask, when are you going to stop saying that? And, and my response always is, when are you going to start believing that? Because we, we nod our head, yes, that's right, every problem is a prayer problem. And yet for many of us, prayer is like that, do not use unless it's a case of emergency, right? Use only in the case of emergency. We break the glass and now we bring out the prayer. We waited until the problem was really big or uh, whatever. God says, listen, every problem, even the little ones, they're a prayer problem. Every opportunity is a prayer opportunity. Don't worry about everything. Pray about everything. So this became real in my life. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, my story, I lost a scholarship when I was in college and uh, just threw it away. So suddenly I had to figure out how to pay my way or, or quit, and I didn't want to quit, so I had to get some jobs. And I just really started to dial into prayer at that point, really praying that God would provide for me, and, and that was my need. You know, this crisis in my life, that was my need, and I began to draw closer to God. Then I, I come across this, you know, this passage, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. So I tried to have that be more and more and more just a part of my life, even the little things, just asking God for his favor, giving, asking God to uh, give me opportunity. And then during that time, I had told God, and, and I've already referenced this, the adventures in life happen when you say yes, usually, as long as it's not sinful, right? So if as long as it's legal and moral, adventure happens when you say yes. So uh, uh, I was working with, a, uh, I, I said yes to a friend of mine who was working with gangs in Chicago. It was the early 90s. The Humboldt Park Wars were going on. A whole bunch of my friends got murdered during that time. It was a really crazy time. Lots of people that I knew were, were killed. And it was during that time I started praying for people that were living really rough lives. They were far from God and they need Jesus. I love these people, right? They, they were people I really cared about and I wanted them to be safe, but uh, more importantly, I wanted them to know Jesus and go to heaven, right? And let God change their life. And so I began praying for people who were far from God and I began to see God use me and use others around me to make a difference and, and uh, uh, to see lives change. And then it was during that time, my wife and I were dating, we got engaged, I start praying for our marriage, God give us a great marriage. And, and you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated our 26th anniversary and God's been, you know, my wife would say it's been, you know, good 15 great years. Been 26 great ones for me, but you know, just praying for marriage. God, God's given us this really great, not perfect, but great marriage. And uh, we started praying for our kids and that God would bless them and God would move in their life. And we saw God do that. And then uh, 27 years old, I started working at a church down in Texas. And uh, the pastor, the senior pastor was 30. The youth pastor was the oldest guy on staff. He was 33. <laughs> Can you imagine going to that church? That was nuts. So uh, we, we had a, it was a church that had almost died. There was a thousand seat auditorium, twice as big as this space. We had 110 people attending when we, the three of us showed up to see if we could get it turned around and, and go in another direction. We knew we had to get out of that thousand seat auditorium and there was some trouble with that. It just didn't work. Some people didn't want to move. And, uh, and so the, we had a whole bunch more building. We need to move in another space. So the senior pastor on Monday morning, after we had the meeting on Sunday night, Monday morning, he goes, well, that's just, he was just so mad. And so he says, we need to pray God sends us a hurricane. And uh, we were right on the Gulf Coast. And uh, the youth pastor says, well, this isn't hurricane season. He said, all right, let's pray for a tornado. Get on your knees. We're going to pray for a tornado. So we get on our knees, pray God send us a tornado, tear down our building. Our thousand seat, multi-million dollar. But we didn't think it through. <laughs> God send us this tornado. That was on Monday. The next Monday. A tornado touched down in the back corner of our, of our property, knocked down our fence, came across, tore the roof off of part of our gym, jumped our daycare. We had 145 kids in the daycare. Landed on our auditorium, tore it off of its foundation, knocked down a wall. One brick went through a car's window across the street. Tornado went back up in the sky. Eyewitnesses saw it happen. Seven days later. That's when I started praying to God, give me the Powerball numbers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hasn't worked yet. But... Uh, Church exploded after that, right? Once we cleaned up the mess, church exploded. We led so many people to Jesus, began transforming that community. It was really amazing when we finally gave up our attachment to that thing and, and uh, started reaching people for, for God. So that was amazing. And, you know, so many other ones. I, I remember being called to a hospital. And, you know, I don't get to do this all the time, but I, I was able to do it then and, and uh, go to the hospital and, and the family called me in. The doctors are telling us we need to unplug dad and and so we go in to pray for dad, and he was cold to touch. And You've seen people, no color anymore. It was just all gone. And the doctor said, the machines are keeping him alive, and we don't know what to do. So he a godly man, good Christian, great testimony. So we just laid hands on him. We prayed, said, God, 
You know his story, and we'd like him to stay with us, but, you know, the Bible says it's precious in your sight when one of your saints goes to heaven. And so either way, we give him to you, we trust you. We go back out in the lobby, we're talking, so, man, we're going to have to call family around and all that stuff to unplug him. The doctors come out a little while later and go, well, we don't know what you did in there, but he's better, right? And he did. He just turned around. Two days later, he went home. I know. I'm afraid I used that prayer up too, maybe. I don't know, right? Because... <laughs> It's never happened since. I've prayed for people I love that weren't healed, but in that moment, that guy had a lot more to do, and, and so God raised him up. I've seen God answer prayers. And so it's, it's interesting. You know, it's little stuff. God, I need to pray. I need to pay my bills. i got to figure out how to stay in school, and, 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 and I want to honor you, right? I made these dumb mistakes, but I want to honor you. And then it was just normal stuff, praying for my marriage, praying for my kids, and then praying for, you know, people that were fired from God, my gang member friends to come to Jesus, and then, and then, you know, we start praying for bigger and bigger things. The little things lead to bigger things, lead to bigger things, lead to bigger things. It's like you're building up right? All these positive things, enough to where you begin to believe. God answered my prayers before, he'll answer them again. So much so that, you know, even the little things, I just know God's going to take care of, me, care of me because God took care of me in the past. Uh, I, I take little things, pray about everything, don't worry about anything. And after a while, that begins to build. You want to know how to build your faith? Pray. That's how you build your faith. Pray and then say yes when God gives you an opportunity. Those are the two ways to build your faith. People say, oh, I want to be a person of strong faith. So your family needs you to be a person of strong faith before the problems come, right? Not, not working, trying to catch up. It, it, I used to be that way in school, right? I had a project that was signed at the beginning of, assigned to me at the beginning of the semester. In the last 36 hours, man, I'm cramming a whole semester's worth of research into the last few hours trying to get that paper done, right? That's what we do a lot of times. We know faith is important. We know we need God's power in our life, but oftentimes we're not motivated to move that way until the problem's there. Your family needs you to be out ahead of it. So you build and build and build and build and build. You don't worry about anything. You pray about everything. Every problem is a prayer problem. Every opportunity is a prayer opportunity. So we're going to pray about all those things. We're also going to pray for the advancement of God's kingdom across the world and in the lives of the people we love right next to us. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he'll give you everything you need. When your heart begins to break for the things that break the heart of God, when you begin to realize that there are people far from God that don't know him yet, they need a spiritual breakthrough. They need, they need salvation. We need to begin pr- pr- praying that God will soften their hearts to the gospel and that God would use us and others to, to bring the gospel to them. When we begin to seek God's kingdom first, then he says all these other things that you need will be added to you too. So we say, God, you know, uh, there's all kinds of things to pray about. There's nothing wrong. He said, pray about what? Everything. That's right. So that that means you need a job, pray for a job. You need God's peace in your life, pray for peace in your life. Uh, Aunt Millie needs her bunions healed, pray for Aunt Millie's bunions. But Jesus said, there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus said, seek his kingdom first, and all these other things will be added to you. When you start being concerned about people that are far from God first, When you start praying the same way Jesus prayed, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, first, God says, all these other things we can take care of too. So it it demonstrates your priorities. It it demonstrates where your focus is, where your faith is. If your focus is on God being a genie, making all your wildest dreams come true, regardless of his kingdom, maybe not. But when you're dialed in saying, God, my greatest desire is that my nephew, my niece, my son, my daughter, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my coworker, my neighbor that's far from you, My ultimate desire is that you would go before, that you'd soften hearts, that you would bring them to yourself, that they would get to know you. When when your heart begins to break for the things that break the heart of God, you begin to seek justice around the world. You begin to seek to find lost people and bring them to Jesus. Seek first his kingdom and all these other things that you need will be added as well. That's what he says. And so here's what what we have in your program uh, or on your seat. There's a card, right? Here's what I want to do. We've got crosses here. At the end of the service, i got one more short thing to say. But at the end of the service, write down a name of somebody that you love, somebody that you care about, somebody that is far from God that needs a spiritual breakthrough. And we'll pray for them too. Don't write their last name. Just write their last initial. We don't want to embarrass anybody, right? God knows who we're talking about. And over the next 21 days, we're going to pray for them. We'll put them up in the prayer spaces that we're going to be at in the mornings. And we'll pray over those names. We'll join with you. We'll pray together. And then you join us. So at the end of the service, music will be playing, and, and we're going to invite you to come and put those at the foot of the cross because the cross is, makes all the difference. And then we're going to gather together every morning at 6 a.m., Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. on Saturdays because none of us are that good of a Christian. And we're going to pray. 
right? We're going to pray for God's kingdom. We're going to pray about all those other things. We're going to give you these 21 model prayers that will help you pray about just about everything in your life. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. There's fellowship when we gather together, the word together, right? There's this friendship that happens, but there's also tremendous power that happens when we gather together to pray. Not just a private, quiet prayer. There's power in that too. But he said there's extraordinary power when we come together to pray. So that's what we're going to do. And then the third thing that Jesus says is when you fast, right? And fasting demonstrates my faith. Fasting demonstrates my faith. There's all kinds of fasts in the Bible. Jesus went 40 days with no food. Um, I'm not going to do that one this time. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you've never fasted for an extended period of time, I, I wouldn't recommend it, right? You need to seek a medical advice first. Be safe on this. It can be dangerous to your sugar. It can be dangerous to your heart. Lots of things like that. But there's lots of other fasts, too. Uh, one of them, Daniel, the Daniel fast has kind of become popular. Lots of people talk about it now. But uh, basically, Daniel, he, he decided no rich foods and no rich meats. He just dialed in on fruits and vegetables and soups and things like that. Matter of fact, it also said no fancy lotions. Please use deodorant, <laughs> right? But this food thing, some people, you know, will do a version that, that they say that they're only going to eat things that come from a seed and liquids, like, you know, soups and smoothies or whatever. Whatever. The, the point behind a fast is to, is to remove something for a short period in your life that you normally would do, not even necessarily cause pain, but to give you a reminder here's an opportunity to pray. I'm going to remove this thing so that every time I normally, some people it'd be Diet Coke. You'll feel like you're going to die. No Diet Coke, but for some people that might be what it is, right? Uh, for others, it, th there's all kinds of things. Social media fast. <laughs> Good luck on that one. <laughs> my, my question would be, what would you be willing to give God in order to see spiritual breakthrough in your life or in the lives of the people you care about? That's all God's asking for. But when you fast, he says, Jesus said, your father who sees everything will reward you. So the purpose of a fast is to deny yourself something that you normally would enjoy so that it reminds you to pray. It also reminds you to develop an appetite for God, right? It reminds you what is essential for your life. God is essential for your life, not food, not stuff, not media, whatever. So there's this guy who brings his, uh, brings his son to Jesus. He apparently is demon-possessed, and, and he says, Jesus, if you can heal my son. And Jesus said, what do you mean, if? Of course I can heal your son. He, said, he says this, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. <laughs> Help my own belief. Honestly, I think it's my favorite passage in the whole Bible. This guy's like, I believe enough to come and ask you, but I also have my doubts, right? So I believe, but help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, this demon, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the demon obeyed Jesus. And when he'd come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Because the, the disciples had already tried. It didn't work. And so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting, what Jesus said. So you want to go into heavy-duty spiritual warfare over the next 21 days, add a fast. It's not about not go, or going without food for 21 days or whatever. You can just say, God, I'm giving up this thing in my life for these next 21 days because I'm that committed to a spiritual breakthrough. So I want to pray for you. The man's going to come out. They're going to sing a song. You're going to bring your names of the people we're going to pray for to the cross and then stand at your seat and sing with us as we remind ourselves that God really is great. So, Father, we thank you that you love us. Almost every person in this room sitting here right now can immediately think of a major spiritual breakthrough that they need in their lives or in the lives of the people that they love around them. And so, God, we're coming to the cross today. We're coming to you today. You know the needs beyond anything we can even comprehend. And you love us. And you say that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. You say to pray about everything and not worry about anything. And you say to seek your kingdom first and all these other things to be taken care of as well. So for the next 21 days, God, we're promising we're coming to you every day. We're going to develop this habit of depending on you, starting our day in the same way Jesus did in prayer. And then, God, we're going to look for your power in our life. We're going to look for you to transform the lives of the people that we love. We're going to trust that you're going to provide everything that we need because, God, 
you truly are great. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray.